I'm a leader of a treatment facility and we deal with children and uh, lots of these children are medicated. I'm, I just recently uh, taking up this position and uh, I'm really worried about how to deal with these dilemmas around the medication. I gather it would be a bad idea just to say, you know, get off the medicines, you know. <laughs> it probably wouldn't help them, you know. So. Well, a lot of these people who refuse to come here, leading Danish psychiatrists, they should somehow uh, taste a little of their own medicine, uh, forced treatment, which in this case means to see the video. <laughs> yes. You, you know, um, I, I don't think there's any more profound question out there right now. Uh, if you're medicating, a, even 3% is a lot. You know, we're, we're getting close to 15% of our kids are being medicated. The stimulants, in some ways, I think, have the best profile of different class of drugs in terms of kids. If you look at SSRIs, uh, in terms of, they don't really, don't even, they're not even really effective over the short term in youth. And the data around antipsychotics in kids is really, really problematic. One of the most uh, moving experiences I had while uh, reporting anatomy of an epidemic. I went to this place in, in California, near, near Oakland, which worked with the worst kids. By the worst kids, it's supposedly the most severely ill kids. They were designated as level 12 plus plus. So level 12 was the most severely ill kids. Plus plus meant no hospital wanted them, no foster care. They could not go anywhere. This was the last step. That residential facility was run by an extraordinary man named Tony Stanton, a psychiatrist. And since 1987, he had been taking all the kids arriving there off medication. And he did so with this thought. One, if they're level 12 plus plus, obviously it's not working. So we need to try something different. That was his first thought. His second thought, he says this, I don't ask what's wrong with the kid, I ask what's happened to the child. And he would spend like 12 hours, 15 hours, building a life story of that child. And every child generally had a horrible life story. I mean, these were like, you know, impoverished kids, abused kids, etc. And I spent a couple days there, and I asked the staff, I said, well, what are they like when they come in? These are heavily medicated kids. Well, they can't even keep their head off the table. That's how heavily medicated they are. And I said, well, what happens when you take them, take them off the meds? I said, for a while, well, the first thing, they all said the exact same thing. What do you think every staff member said about the change in behavior in the kids? They all had one line. They come alive again. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard over and over again. They came alive again. In terms of behavior, there was some, you know, there was a lot of difficult behavior, especially initially. But what Tony Stanton believed was that no human being, no child, can organize their behavior except in relationship to another human being. You can't organize your behavior by yourself. So what he believed is they needed mentors and people they wanted to impress. So he had a lot of young, hip, staff members, like who were 18, or really more like 20, 21, 22. And the whole point was, the therapy was, those kids would learn to want to get the affection of those 20 and 21 years and 22 year olds. Anyway, that form of care was enormously successful. Without almost exception, the kids left with much better behavior. I don't want to make it sound like they were, you know, everything was fine. But they went down on the on the on the this grading level. When I got there, by the way, the kids who'd been there six months had just come back from a trip to Disneyland. So, to my mind, that was an example of a societal response where they really were putting some time and effort into those kids. And what they were showing, and have been showing for 20 some years, is there were other ways to manage the most disturbed children. Now, the, the bad part of this is, after my book, that program was shut down. Oh. Because what happens is, and Stone, Tony left, 
is certain people complained as those kids because they were being taken off medication were not getting the standard of care. They were being denied good medical care. And it didn't matter that they were doing better. And so they shut it down. And that was the last residential program I know of that took the most disturbed kids and as a matter of course, took them off medications. And by the way, most of them came in, they were on seven, eight, three, four antipsychotics. Um, anyway, my, that's very long-winded, sorry. But I think you're in a very difficult spot. I just want to say that for many years in the place where I work, in Gothenburg, we have had this uh, issue on the agenda and when it's children and young people also to inform their parents about the figures and the research we have been presented today. Uh, and so far that is, I would like to say it's absolutely um, possible. It's not easy, <laughs> but it's possible and it's absolutely worth it. I just want to say that. It's obvious that uh, when you are coming to a place like this and you meet some kind of hundred saved souls already, it's easy for us to appreciate what you're saying. And, and um, the problem is when Peter is coming to a place and he's not a psychiatrist, uh, so he doesn't, he doesn't get really appreciated from, from the psychiatrist. The way you are performing and telling about your facts, it's very much, uh, which I really appreciate, the facts about uh, the pharmacology. And this is research that you are talking about is the, the research about um, the brain and so on. Do you ever think, because I know that you are very um, happy about the, the Lapland model, do you think that the things that are happening to people who doesn't take medication anymore, what is the alternative to the medication? I mean, we work in lots of people here with, with the therapy and like Christian said and Gothenburg as well. But I think we need research also what's happening to the other part, the psychosocial uh, treatment. In my opinion, there's been an absolute dearth of research in terms of how best to get off medications. What, uh, you know, one of the points is so often these are just studies where they withdraw it, but they don't provide other support. So there's, there's really no information on like what other types of things might help people, the, the timing of the, you know, how slow, how fast. You can go on the internet and, and there's user groups that are sharing a lot of information about how they did it. And they'll talk about yoga, diet, exercise. They'll also talk about the need for social support because often withdrawal is very difficult. Um, in other words, during those dark times, having someone to go to. Uh, <clears throat> I think the problem here is, 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 is really profound in this sense. We have a system that opens the door for people going on medication but the system hasn't built an exit door for going on. And unfortunately, it's, it's being left up to the patients. Um, I'd like to see research into this and, and really try to figure out the very questions you're asking. About not being a psychiatrist, um, Charles Darwin was neither a biologist nor a geologist. And, uh, and yet he contributed more than most researchers can ever hope for. It is an argument that I have described earlier and I call it the you are not one of us argument which primitive people have used at all times. My work for the last five years has been supporting people trying to taper off drugs. What we can see is that a lot of people in different institutions get a huge amount of medication with serious uh, interactions, side effects and everything. And there is good evidence that tapering off these drugs will improve uh, overall conditions for people living in different kinds of institutions. When you talk about long-term damage to the brain, do you have any... Uh idea about how, how many years or how long time do you have to take medication for it to be a irreversible damage. And uh, I'd also like to uh, emphasize that it's very important to, to uh, give an alternative because I think the problem is that it's very cheap to give people drugs <laughs> and the alternative is uh, psychotherapy for instance or, or 
like uh, in Finland to work with the, the network around the people and it takes a lot more time and a lot more money. But um, if uh, you can gather information that this is the way to do it, it will be easier to emphasize this. So, About psychotherapy, it's often used as an excuse for using drugs because there are waiting lists for psychologists and things like that. And it's a very bad excuse. You should not excuse, you should not use drugs if you think they will do more harm than good, which a lot of these drugs actually will do in such a situation. S second, it's not even an excuse. There are many studies that have compared professional psychotherapists with amateurs, lay people, and they have shown very disturbingly to the professionals <laughs> that ordinary people can have or actually they get equally good results as people with a psychotherapeutic education. Yes. All it takes is to have an interest in fellow human beings <laughs> and listen to them and take them seriously and be warm and loving and have some empathy and you can produce remarkable results. <laughs> I was just going to answer real quickly your question about what is long term and like let's say the brain shrinkage and that sort of thing. Uh, we don't know because it's a, it's a, again it shows the lack of, of research into this. I will, but it seems to be quite variable. That's number one. So if you look at tardive dyskinesia, you know it's five percent per year. At least it used to be in the United States, which shows different vulnerabilities to this sort of the toxic effects. That's one. Two, youth, for example, have higher TD rates after one year than, than adults, but it seems to be reversible often in youth, which shows the sort of the capacity of the younger brain to uh, heal itself. So my answer to you is this. There's so many unanswered questions related to long-term use. The data, it suggests that it's quite variable um, but we need, if we're going to be putting 10, 15% of our population on these medications and for longer term, these are the very questions we need to answer. My name is Susanne. I am also a politician and I'm also a member of the psychiatry committee. I'm speaking also um, as a representative of a former use of the system and having been drugged and drugged and drugged myself. Society as it is today is heavily controlling people's behaviors and are having, is having a norm of what is normal behavior. So people who do not act according to what is considered normal behavior are punished or treated. So one thing is the terror of showing emotions in society. It's considered a disease instead of a healing factor. The other thing is that you should not be seen as a case. You should be seen as a complete human being. And this is where the peer comes into place. If you are both seen as someone who can give and needs attention, then you are not put in a position either of the giver or the taker, but you are seen as a full human being. And I have been uh, teaching and using methods like this for many years and with good results, and I have been off drugs for more than 30 years. I've never missed them. <laughs> I always get very uh, um, emotional, actually, when I hear about all these statistics and these numbers and the horror of, for me, I think the horror of psychiatric treatment. I myself have been a given up schizophrenic on maximum dosage, and I've been left dribbling in the corner for 10 years. Um, I, I escaped, and I've uh, decided to become a psychologist after that experience. But what I'd like to actually ask, really, is um, since uh, we are here, you know, and there are the psychiatric, uh, the psychiatrists refuse to come, which, as I've written, just written on my Facebook, shame on them. Um, I'm thinking, I'm curious, because now that in America, for example, they've given up 
on the idea of the, uh, the myths, actually, and in Denmark, only just now, this year, after Peter Gutscher wrote his uh, article in, in the Politiken on the ten myths, that we're now beginning to say, well, there is true that uh, chemical disorder and stuff is not actually really true. Um, but I get you that you're being more sort of accepted. So what is the new psychiatric tactic to keep going, I'm wondering, so that we can perhaps be a little bit prepared here in Denmark? Um, if <laughs> I don't know if you have an answer to that one, but I was just wondering. A, the chemical imbalance story is, is dead, okay? Uh, that's especially with the low serotonin theory. That's just, it's just considered, okay, we know that's not true. That's number one. Number two, our head uh, psychiatrist at the NIMH is Tom Insel. He's the director of the NIMH. And after the wondering study on antipsychotics, I wrote about. He wrote a blog raising an issue that, again, just was, would have been seen as heresy four years ago. He said, well, look at Harrow. Look at Wondering. We may have to ask, do antipsychotics impair long-term outcomes? Now, that broke a taboo. In other words, you, that was not something that was, you could speak in psychiatry five years ago. But now the very fact that our top schizophrenia you know, not schizophrenia, our top, uh, <laughs> not just on schizophrenia, but our top researcher at the NIMH, the director of the NIMH is saying this is a valid question. That's opening up a new discussion. So that's happening. Tom Insel also said it's clear that all these new medications, they haven't reduced the burden of, of mental disorders. We're not seeing an improvement in outcomes. So on the one hand, Tom Insel is, is, is opening up a new discussion, and frankly, I think anatomy did as well. Mm. That's good. We're also seeing a couple uh, pilot projects trying to replicate the open dialogue results. Mm. There's a foundation that formed in the United States called the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care. It formed in response to anatomy. It's trying to raise, a, raise research funds around these issues. Mm. Syracuse University is seeking to hold a conference on what are the long-term effects of antipsychotic medications. That's all good, right? So intellectually, certain things are changing, but how about practices? Yeah. Nothing is changing. In other words, the amount of medication, the amount of people taking medications is going up. We're expanding. There's a new law to provide more funding so states can expand forced treatment programs. Yeah. If you're coming out of a hospital, um, you're very likely to end up with a court order mandating that you take antipsychotics. Uh, so the irony is, at certain high levels, the discussion is changing, but on the ground, it's going full force, more medicating of kids, more medic... So I don't know. It's, it's both a little bit optimistic and very reason for pessimistic. A systematic review was published recently that showed that forced treatment programs don't work. Hi, my name is Mette Sophie Horik. I'm um, representing the Danish Nurses uh, Organization. One thing is um, what's happening in clinical practice, but I think what's really worrying is the uh, society and our responsibility to people. Um, you were mentioning this yourself about the young people, what is our responsibility as a society? Um, and my worry is also that, that a lot of this discussion becomes very specific and therefore may be very difficult for ordinary people to decide who's right, who's wrong. So I think what we really need is for the politicians also to look at this and say, what is our responsibility for the society and the future of the children and the um, weak people? And how do we give the best treatment and start researching what is actually going on? But also in the society we have today, medical companies are extremely powerful. Um, so, so it's a very difficult fight that we are up against, I think. So um, I think it's, it's a matter of, of people like all of you here working in this field, um, continuing talking about this, but also I think it, we need people in the decision positions to actually 
engage into this and, and uh, start researching into this field. But I would like to thank you for this. I think it's been really um, an eye-opening for me. Thank you. When I w was writing this book, I eventually thought, who, who really do I want to read it? I really wanted the psychiatrist to read it. It's really, I'm just the messenger holding up a story of their own research and putting it together into a coherent uh, picture. And I guess my hope was um, that it would be a way to say, is this current paradigm of care working? And if not, then that opens a discussion to, well, then what should we do? And my hope was, it's a, you're exactly right. This is a beginning place, but what you want is a larger societal discussion about well, is this paradigm of care working? And if not, then what should we do as a society? How do we take care of each other? And how do we even think about depression? It's even a philosophy. What does it mean to be alive? The battle in the press is always a very unfair one, that even if one person tells the truth and can point out that the other person is lying, then journalists still might say on the one hand and on the other hand and therefore we don't know. I have tried this and I have explained to a journalist, look here, that person is lying. I, you can see it here in black and white. And still when a journalist writes about it, they have learned a journalist school that there should be on the one hand and on the other and this is terrible. But I, I can just tell you that in the long run, in the long run, it works. It was Abraham Lincoln who said the famous words, you can fool some people some of the time, you can't fool everyone all of the time. You know, it, sooner or later it dawns on people. And I have, I have seen a development, partly based on your book, partly based on other initiatives, in the right direction. That is very, very clear. Even the chairman behind these terrible diagnostic manuals from the American Psychiatric Society they are now deeply concerned about the mess they have created. Even the chairman of the DSM-3 from 1980, where he introduced all this checklist nonsense that uh, by consensus you decided that if you have six points out of ten, then you have this diagnosis, raise your hands, and it was so unscientific and even he now objects to what he introduced in 1980. He is in his 80s now, uh, so it's easier to admit mistakes when you are at that age, of course. Um, but I, I also saw it when I was in London two weeks ago, when I was key speaker in the House of Lords around this new organization, and um, the, the, the press over there covered it very favorably, the Guardian, Sunday Telegraph, The Times. And then I was interviewed on direct radio, uh, BBC Belfast, where I said some of the same things that I've said here. And then they interviewed a professor of psychiatry from Belfast. And don't drop down your chairs now, because what he said is, oh, I haven't seen any good studies documenting that SSRIs lead to sexual disturbances. I haven't seen any good studies that document that it's difficult to come off them. And then he even said, psychotherapy doesn't work. <laughs> there are lots of randomized trials that show that they work. And then there was some other person talking like someone from Lundbeck, uh, like uh, depression is a serious disease and things like that. We really need to take it very seriously and things like that. And, and, and then, it, it, funnily enough, it was Lord Sandwich, uh, his ancestor invented the sandwich, uh, who was uh, chairing this meeting. And, and I had the role of a sandwich because I started and I was allowed to end. So what I said by the end is that it's all perfectly well documented that this psychiatrist had said, and then I was cut off. But you know, isn't that, it's unbelievable, it's science fiction. A professor of psychiatry is denying everything. Isn't, isn't that delusional? First of all, thanks to both of you for uh, very inspiring and good talks. Um, I often wonder uh, what 
makes the psychiatric diagnosis medical. There are, as far as I know, very few biological markers for the uh, for psychological or psychic diseases um, after DSM-3 and 4 and 5 uh, we have systems of classification of behavior verbal and nonverbal uh, developed by agreement in uh, committees um, so also it's a sort of a comment to that you have to be inside, uh, be an insider to have opinions about this uh, diagnosis. Also, uh, how medical are they actually? <laughs> <clears throat> oh boy! Um, I, I I had a good friend in psychiatrist who is a professor in Denmark that I have known for many years and have corresponded with him for many years sometimes. And uh, so we have discussed also some of these recent things. Um, he cut off relations with me when I published this article in Politiken in January. And another occasion where he became angry was when I said that the way psychiatrists make diagnoses uh, is not scientific. It's mainly consensus-based. That made him very angry, but that is a fact. Uh, so um, you are absolutely right, and there are no biological markers. You can't look in the blood and say anything about psychiatric diseases. Um, so what we more need than anything else is to get away from diagnosing people. My father was a psychologist, and when I was very young, he, he said to me, you should not put labels on people. I really understand that today, what he meant. He dealt with children because he was also a teacher, a school teacher. He knew what he was talking about. Uh, there are many cases where people have complained that even when the a diagnosis of schizophrenia was completely wrong, it's almost impossible to get rid of it again. And if you first got the diagnosis, and it can even be a foolish diagnosis like premenstrual dysphoric uh, disorder, which, wo which works equally well for men, that, <laughs> that, uh, that when these criteria for the disorder was tried on men, they also felt miserable. Does, does that mean that men should also be treated once a month? Uh, so you see, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's and, and even if you just got this dysphoric, what was it, premenstrual disorder diagnosis, it could actually have effect if you're getting a divorce, because you're not psychologically stable, so the children goes to your husband because you're a patient, you know. It has all sorts of ramifications. So we should stop this nonsense. Could, could I just tell you about this famous study that was published in Science in 1973, I think. A psychiatrist and seven of his colleagues decided that they should go to psychiatric hospitals and say that they heard voices. So they were all admitted. And the whole exercise was get out as quickly as possible. So as soon as they had become admitted, they were completely normal. And some of the patients actually understood this, that you are not a real patient. But, but uh, the, the, the psychiatrist didn't understand it, and uh, they kept them for a median of 19 days. And the guy who was a psychiatrist, they kept him for two months, just to be sure. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they were all, uh, they, when they came out of hospital, they all had the same diagnosis, schizophrenia in remission. They were completely normal. When, when the hospitals learned about this, they become very upset. And, and then they said, please send us some new fake patients and we will tell you which ones they are. Okay, Rosenhan said, we will send you some fake patients. So then after some additional months, the psychiatrist had identified some fake patients. And then Rosenhan said, Oh, uh, we never send any. <laughs> Psychiatry in some ways is really in a crisis. Because one of the things that's happening in the, again in the United States is it's a rec there's increasing recognition that the diagnoses are not valid. 
And in fact, again, Tom Insel recently said, you know, these disorders have not been validated. So there's an understanding that if you go back to 1980, these were hypotheses. The idea was that they would get validated. And even by their own terms, it hasn't happened. And people are even talking about uh, to doing research using different diagnoses. So there's a real sense that the whole DSM edifice is, is collapsing. If I went into a mechanic and uh, he fixed my car, but after a couple of uh, years, the motor began to get smaller, I would, of course, uh, I would, of course, uh, sue him. And uh, now we have had sort of like a psych psychopharmaca on a trial today, and I, I think it's guilty in the long term of disrupting uh, the engine. What do you think about uh, su people suing, actually, uh, psych psychiatric patients after a while having terrible uh, effects of the psychopharmaca? There have been some efforts increasingly to have some lawsuits. But generally what happens is this. Each side will get their experts, and moral experts will be on the other side, and the experts will blame the disease, not the drugs. And that's one. And two, in many ways, once people get a label of seriously mentally ill, they're not seen as worth much. I I'm serious about this. So uh, it becomes hard to sue for those two reasons. One, whatever the loss is not, is not seen as that great, and two, it's almost always a discussion, is it the disease or the drug? And many people say it's the disease. So there have been some efforts to sue around at least TD, diabetes. They, uh, diabetes, they've had a little bit of success when they were covering that up. But now that they're warned about it, they can't sue. Um, it's a good question. Uh, it, the law has a, a chance to really force change, but so far it hasn't been very successful, other than risks that weren't disclosed. The big problem, we have already heard about what it is, that when something is considered standard of care, you will lose the lawsuit. So if everybody is doing the wrong thing, I mean... Yeah, okay, that's a good point. <laughs> I'm a uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, I do a lot of uh, withdrawal uh, work. Um, at the same time, I'm uh, very, very well uh, aware of um, that um, these issues are also very cultural uh, de uh, determined. So in a way, psychiatry is also uh, kind of uh, popular. <laughs> Medication, diagnosis and so on. So I used to say, if uh, these issues are popular, are attractive, then uh, we, have, uh, we have an obligation to do things that could be even more attractive. Uh, so, uh, in a way, it's also a societal issue about uh, schools, about uh, the way uh, uh, children are, are being raised, uh, about our organizations, our institutions, and so on. So it's a big issue about how can, uh, how can we help people feel less powerless so that they don't feel like psych psychiatry being as, uh, attractive. When we go with the withdrawal issue, then we have to think it uh, as a, a big issue uh, to uh, also involve people in being part of a process that can be even more attractive. Again, this goes to societal obligations, right? So society has an obligation to nurture its children and do the, and basically give children, for example, the best opportunity to thrive and then make something of themselves as adults. And what is amazing to me is there's been many, many, many generations of human beings that managed to raise their kids without the use of stimulants. So clearly it's possible for societies to do that. And what your question then begins to be if stimulants are not the answers, how do we organize our classrooms? How do we organize our society to support children? That's a much larger question, but that's really the question we need to get to, is what sort of schools do we need? How do we support children to really grow up and be creative, curious, you know, thoughtful human beings? But that's where I think we need to get to. Um, it's, it's so central what you said, sir, and about power or powerlessness. This is central to the whole thing. 
that when you become a patient, you are no longer a freely living citizen with your full power. And, um, and uh, for example, um, without mentioning names, and I don't even know what their names are, I was contacted by a mother and her child in the coffee break. And, um, you know, if, if a person has been on drugs for a number of years, including antipsychotics, then the respect for the system is so big that even after having spent a full day here listening to Bob, who has clearly explained that if you have been on drugs for many years, get off them as quickly as you can, which means very slowly, actually, because you need to taper off very slowly. But still, people are very worried about taking this step because their doctor constantly tells them that you are ill and you need to go on with these drugs, so they get the opposite message. So as somebody said, it requires a lot of power and determination to be a psychiatric patient. You need to be very strong, actually. And this is where your friends and family come into the picture in order to do something different to what your doctor tells you. It's very sad, but that's how it is. Very often we hear that schizophrenia has a strong genetic component, that 60 to 80 percent of the cause of schizophrenia is uh, genetic. Any comments on that? For me, it's very often used as an argument to render scientific validity to the diagnosis, but uh, any comments? And this I see as part of the persuasion package that psychiatrists use to keep people on drugs. It's not your fault, it's a genetic error, so just go on taking the drugs, it's terrible. And I'll give you another example. Um, uh, a leading Danish professor of psychiatry uh, has said that schizophrenia leads to shrinkage of the brain. So therefore it's very important you take antipsychotic drugs. So this is being used to keep patients on drugs. These studies, they were medicated already, as Bob said, but we know for sure that the drugs damage the brain. So it's very sad that these things are used to persuade patients to take terrible drugs for years. When they've been doing this research, they can't replicate it, they can't find what the genes are. So even though you hear this 60 to 80%, we don't know well, what are the genes that are supposedly that it confers this risk. There may be some genetic vulnerability, et cetera, but it's way overstated. And frankly, some of the data that is sometimes cited goes back to Nazi research, et cetera. So you would think they would just throw that research out. I work at a crisis center, and I'm also the co-chair of the Danish Hearing Voices Network, meaning I'm a voice hearer myself. Um, I want to thank you, Peter, very, very much for bringing up the label issue. The, the label issue, the, the diagnosis issue. Because I think um, there's a huge elephant in the room, especially also when we talk about research, um, that is that the labeled people themselves aren't heard. And I could, I could actually be a bit afraid that even if we start to talk about what can we use otherwise if we can't use medication and so on and so on. That again, once again, it will be a discussion that takes place among professionals and not the people with the lived experience. So, so I would really, really like to see people with lived experience doing or, or even leading um, future research a lot more. There's a lot of valuable points you've made. Um, what I could be worried about is that it turns into this discussion about us against them, um, and it ends up in being a name-calling debate, and the actual patient gets forgotten. I'm a clinical psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I work with a lot of psychiatrists, and I, I don't think any of them is interested in harming their patients uh, whatsoever. And so I'm a little bit um, puzzled after this day what your agenda really is. Um, yeah. Two parts on this. One part, my agenda is to make this information known 
And the expectation is then uh, people of goodwill that do want, that will engender a societal discussion about what we do differently. And is this current paradigm of care working or do we need to do something differently? And really it comes with the expectation of people are of goodwill, we want to do best by other people, and, and this could be a starting point. So if I have an agenda, this would be a starting point for a discussion. And then when we talk about psychiatry as a whole, in some ways I think you, you, you need to just make a bit of a distinction. There are plenty of practicing psychiatrists who of course have nothing but a desire for, to help people get well. And, but then there's also really a, a research psychiatry, an academic psychiatry that has a lot of financial influences on them, career advancements, and they really get invested in a certain story. And then they'll defend that story as well, even when maybe the research literature is telling them to amend that story or to do something differently. So, I mean, I think you're really on something important here is the, uh, the, the relation, it ultimately gets to how do we change as well, right? In other words, how do we do right by people? And then the other thing here is, is that Peter's been referring to is questions of power, authority in society, what role psychiatry plays in society. Uh, if you look at the history of psychiatry, often the question is, who are they meant to serve? Are they meant to serve the patients, or then sometimes are they meant to, to serve certain sort of social control issues? And so those issues also have to be up for discussion. But if you want to know my agenda, my agenda is that um, we, we have this idea that uh, science and evidence base should guide discussions. And, and what I've tried to bring here today and also in the book is this information that's in the research literature to the fore with the idea that well, it can engender a larger societal discussion about what do we do better? How do we change? And again, in, in many instances, I've been asked to give presentations just to psychiatrists. So there's many well-meaning psychiatrists, even in academic psychiatry, that want to confront this information. But anyway, that's how I think we go forward. If I read scientific literature and I think that some people are not, what should I say, honest about what this literature tells us, then you're right. I have an agenda. I want to get the truth out. I'm fighting for that. Uh, because then we can create a better society. But if people turn their back to the truth because it threatens their power position and their convenience and what they have become used to and all that sort of thing, then I'm prepared to fight very hard to getting the truth out. And that's why I have taken, taken up this. It all started by an, a coincidence. I'm a specialist in internal medicine. And one day a person came up to my office and said, would you support me in a PhD called, is history repeating itself? A comparison of benzodiazepines and SSRIs. And I said, yes, that seems a very relevant project. That is more than six hours, uh, six years ago. And now we are six people doing research on SSRIs, on unpublished material I got from the European Medicines Agency. So I have seen data that very few people in the world have seen. And these data worry me. So uh, I'm going on like that. And there are some of the best psychiatrists in this world know that their specialty is in deep crisis. We just need to make the others understand that that is what it is, and then agree on some common agenda for the future. And can, can, can I add one thing to uh, your, your point here? One thing as I was trying to go through the antipsychotics was people don't see this. The clinician doesn't see this data. The clinician doesn't see this sort of long-term course. It's hidden. The clinician actually is seeing that the medications work short-term and that when people come off, they do very poorly. And what science here is really illuminating is an extraordinary paradox. And I actually think it's an extraordinary tale of scientific discovery to show something that's not immediately apparent to the clinician. 
And then the question is, how do people respond to that? And one of the problems is, if you start organizing a society's response to psychiatric distress around, say, one paradigm of care, it becomes very hard to switch to another paradigm of care, uh, you know, because you don't have alternatives, you have financial forces, et cetera. And all I'm saying is, if, if change is going to ha happen, you, you've got to invite everyone into the discussion. And you've got to start with a sense of people are of goodwill and try to go forward from that point.